What's up, everyone? Welcome. We are at Tony Robbins Unleash the Power Within. I'm with my buddy, Jim Williamson. Hi. What's up, man? Nice to see you. Thanks for coming on to the show. You're welcome. Greatly appreciate it. So Jim and I met at Unleash the Power Within in San Jose, mm -hmm. and we were chatting about biohacking. We were doing Vasper, which both of our friends, we had Vasper on the show. You guys have probably seen them before. Um, just biohacking human performance. You were teaching me about hyperbaric oxygen chambers. All this stuff was so interesting. And then he started dropping all this wisdom on me about energy markets. So you're the founder of JPTC Energy. Mm -hmm. And I just want to like unpack all of this cool stuff that you're, that you've learned and that you're bringing to the world. And hopefully we can teach some of our peeps about what is going on. So let's maybe start with like your fascination with energy and then we'll do some biohacking stuff towards the end. Sure. Yeah. So teach us about that. Um, I, I it too. okay. You can relax <laughs> that way. So, um, I started, uh, Come closer to you. yeah. Started my own energy trading company in uh, 2005. Uh, formerly worked at Calpine Corporation, which was a San Jose company, um, uh, for 2001, 2003, and uh, worked for XL Energy, which is a utility based out of Denver. We were um, running three service territories, which I got a lot of good experience doing. And so got a great experience working on two different spectrums of the market. One, the uh, regulated, uh, uh, utility market and won the uh, completely unregulated wholesale market. So completely different opposite spectrums there. And uh, started my company in 2005 trading virtual power, which is something that people have a fascination with when I tell them about it. It's, it's virtual power is, is uh, uh, energy that's traded, traded in the markets where they have these uh, ISOs like the Cal ISO. Your your listeners might be more familiar with California markets or Texas or ERCOT markets. There's uh, independent system operators all across the country, and they run these uh, markets where they're 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 optimizing for dispatch of power on on an ongoing five minute basis. So they're constantly solving, and they're and they're solving for for problems with congestion. Uh, for instance, if there's lots of wind generation in certain pockets and we have problems with our old transmission infrastructure trying to get that to the load centers uh, without having too much, uh, you know, basically overloading the lines. So, Okay, I want to take us into sure. deeper dive into this because you're a professional. We're going to disseminate this in relatable ways. Let's see if we can do this. Um, come a little more in center shot for me. A little bit more. Perfect. That's good. So, because you're the highlight. So, okay. When we walk into our homes, our homes are running electricity, we flick on the light switch, we're pulling from the grid, we are running our fridges all day, those are pulling from the grid, and our internet's propagating, this is all coming you know, from the grid, and so there's this whole idea of optimization uh, during certain peak hours, um, how are we actually getting that energy from what sources is that coming from sustainable like solar wind um, uh, or is that coming from burning fossil fuels and then also uh, you said congestion during these hours so unpack continue unpacking this I just wanted to make it that tiny bit more relatable along the way but teach us about this energy grid and how we're pulling from it and what it means to be in hours of like congestion uh, optimization how we do that how you're doing that yeah, so these markets started in 2001 with the, uh, the PJM uh, market out in uh, Pennsylvania, Jersey, and uh, Maryland. Uh, subsequently, uh, 2005, Midwest ISO started in the Midwest continent, and then California started, I think, in 2009, I think. Um, you got Texas markets, New York, uh, uh, New England, and there's really very few pockets in the country where there's no competition. Uh, which uh, would be like the southeast, the northwest, which is now changing, and they're going to integrate into a, a western grid pretty soon. But so what, what happens is they, they create these what's called a two-term market, a two-settlement market, which you have a day-ahead market and a real-time market. So the day-ahead market is is what's called a financial market, and it's meant to bring uh, roughly 90% of of uh, dollars to the, to the to the table and bring as much price discovery as possible. You have the sellers, which would be the, the generators and the, and the buyers, which would be load, coming to the table and, and entering into the market and trying to find the best optimization for the next day, right? 
So and how would we know what some of the optimizations are for the next day? For example, maybe weather, it might be very uh, uh, cloudy and therefore we can't get as much solar energy. Yeah, it's all based on weather. It's based on user patterns, times of the day. It's based on some things that, you know, socioeconomic uh, uh, factors like, you know, on the, Super, on the day of the Super Bowl, load just drops off precipitously. So, you know, you think people would be having all these TVs on and it would drive up load. But what happens is people go to other people's houses and so they, it's the load drops big time. Fourth of July, holidays, stuff like that. So, Oh, um, interesting. Absolutely. It's, it's a, it's a so very So on holidays, the load on the grid drops because people are inside of each other's houses. Yes. So it's there's a lot of things to it's stuff it's, like this is so cool it's a really fun it's a really see it's, it's a really fun business to be in because it's there's there's so much complexity and it's, it's just so many different angles to approach it from so it's a it's a it's a data miners dream uh <laughs> it's 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 really fun stuff um but what, what happens is, is that you have all these different mixtures of resources right you got coal uh old coal generation um yes. You got hydro, you've got wind, you've got nuclear, you've got gas, you've got peaking gas, you've got oil, and all of these have all kinds of different qualitative or uh, you know restrictive uh, restrictions on their use. So, uh, for instance, a combined cycle gas power plant, 500 megawatt, uh, two by one, uh, two two gas turbine, one steam turbine power plant would maybe have a minimum runtime of 16 hours. So if it's called on to run, it's, they're saying, hey, I'll run, but you need, I need to run 16 hours. So those, those, there's all kinds of restrictions like that, ramp rate restrictions and all kinds of things like that. So the, the challenge with these markets is that you always have to match supply and demand. You always have to maintain 60 hertz. There's no fudge room there. You can't, you know, we, we don't have any, you know, any viable storage right now. Uh, you know, battery technology is coming along, but it's, 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 I find it as a as a as a former submarine guy that used to work on batteries, uh, storage batteries, some of the biggest batteries we've ever made. Um, Damn. I, I find that to be a hard nut to crack because <laughs> it's 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 a it's a big problem. So I there's there's things that you know there's in California you got uh, pump storage, hydros. Um, can't remember the name of the units I was thinking about. But you have a pump storage unit, which is basically is, is a battery, where you have a lower reservoir and an upper reservoir, right? And so at night, the water at the, from the lower reservoir is pumped up, and they're pumping, you know, they're drawing load from the grid, but they're drawing it usually at times of, of low prices when you got typically more yeah. wind generation, prices are low. Yeah. And so you might be, say, pumping up at a price of $10 a megawatt off-peak at, at night to the upper reservoir, and then subsequently during the middle of the day, whenever the prices are highest, you might be spilling at, say, $100, $150. Doesn't, wow. You know, so. Okay. So can we also maybe make this uh, a relatable example could potentially be also that I have battery storage at my house and that I pull from the grid in the middle of the night when it's cheap. And then during the day, I'm not using my energy. So I sell it back off to the grid, can I? Can I? Can we make money that way as well? Or does so you're, you're starting to tap into one of my ideas that Tony has given me. So we were at Business Mastery too in Rotterdam a couple weeks ago. Okay, mm -hmm. and Tony always has this question. He says, "What business are you in?" Which to me is always simple. I go in there. I'm like, I'm, a, I'm an energy trader. So yeah. I'm trying to get some other qualitative, um, you know, uh, improvements on my myself as a business person and so forth. Um, but for me, you know, when it comes to the business, I don't have any sales people. I don't have any customers per se. Um, I interact, I interact strictly with the markets, but it's so interesting. Almost everybody in Silicon Valley has customers and has like a product or a service that they give to customers. So when somebody goes, I don't have products or I don't have uh, customers, but I ha but, and what I do is I only work mostly with markets. That's a very interesting new, like, one percent or less of people that we engage with do just that it's it's a it's a, it's, it's great to not have that stress <laughs> uh don't have a boss and i don't have customers so yeah um so but what tony asks is, is he says you know what business are you in and then what business do you really need to be in you know and so i, I started thinking about and that that's kind of the peter Thiel question is the how can you monopolize in what business do you need to be in the one that nobody else is thinking about that well, you so can take over. I, I have a big idea and um 
and it kind of tops on my experience in the in the power markets as a power plant operator myself, and and um, and seeing where seeing where we're going in the 21st century with with uh, we're in the 21st century, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that, that always messes me up. Yeah. So <laughs> so uh, it's like daylight savings time. Um, so. Uh, we're moving to smart homes, smart controls. Hopefully, right? we make it to the 22nd century. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we yeah. got a lot of things coming ahead of us with AI and robotics that we got to figure out. Yeah. Automation. So, figure so we uh, we're we're moving towards automation and and to more toward, towards smarter controls, right? Yes. So I've been talking to you know even even in the Tony Tony Robbins sphere um, with this uh, Platinum Partners Group and and others. Uh, meeting some, you know, developers that are very forward-thinking. Um, that isn't are, Peter Diamandis talking about this quite a bit with energy. Yeah, he he spoke about this at the finance conference awesome. there in, in Sun Valley. Yeah, so um, we're, we're looking at, you know, res, let's say we have a residential uh, development of a thousand homes. Okay, now we let's say we wire these all together to a central computer. Now, you know, you have privacy concerns and stuff like that, but what we're, what we're really trying to do is, is, is get their, their power, in, uh, power and heating and cooling needs served in the most reliable way or, and the most uh, efficient way, right? So let's say uh, in my, my easy example here is, is that you, you go to work, you load the dishwasher, you push a button, you don't need to have the, dish, the wa dishes washed. Immediately. Immediately, especially if you don't need them an hour later, and yeah. you can wait until energy costs a lot less and yeah. water costs a lot less. Yeah, yeah. same yeah. thing for hot water heaters. Same thing for air conditioning. So, think about this. Come back in a little bit. Yeah. So, yeah, so think, so think about this. You, you've got, um, you know, when you come home from work, you know, whatever time it is, you just want to make sure that your t your house is not too hot. Like, let's say it can't be any any hotter than seventy seven degrees or seventy six degrees, whatever. Um, so you, any kind of flexibility you have in your consumption of load is, is an opportunity to, 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 um, to uh, is create efficiencies there where, let's say you pre-cool the house, say at 6 in the morning, 7 in the morning, or when you go to work, and you cool it down, say, to 65 degrees, which you might think would be Interesting. Right? But Interesting. If, but so if power price now. Wow. Now this is all. Pre, this all presupposes during the day it's going to get hot, yeah. but you've already taken from the grid during the night when it was yeah. less expensive and cooled it yeah. down on your way out. And this yeah. all presupposes that you're exposed to retail rates. That's a big qualifier there, right? Ah. It, under the whole, I'm sorry, wholesale rates. So this all presupposes that. So you know, if if you're able to respond to those those wholesale prices um, in real time. This it creates enormous if, uh, opportunities at, at when you when you start grouping these at in a, a thousand in, homes at a thousand homes or industrial and so wow. forth. When you create portfolios of efficiencies like that, or I'm sorry, uh, or when they're out of the house, just don't you tap into the grid, or maybe tap in like we were talking about at night to fill up and then sell back to the grid during the day when it's peak. There's also opportunities. So there's all, people don't understand this, but there's there's a lot of times when when there's a lot of parts of the country. Where depending on if there's wind or so forth, you know whatever there is uh, constraints for transmission outages or power plant outages, there's a lot of places where where prices are negative. So we're talking about places where it's certain places we want you to consume as much demand as possible because you're getting paid to consume load. Okay, you were teaching me about this um, a couple months back, and it was blowing my mind. Um, okay, so when we're looking at an energy uh, map, we're looking at energy map, and we see that in Oklahoma there's either there's these numbers and they can either be positive or negative numbers um, okay so then you can either get uh, you either have to pay to get energy from the grid or there are times when they have a lot of energy that you can get paid to take the energy when, when from. When prices go negative you're getting paid to consume loads so you want to consume as much as possible so an example of this is so would be weird. Google set up a, a server farm up there north of uh, Omaha okay on the border between Nebraska and, and Iowa um, they apply for wholesale market rates, um, and so they, at any given time, if prices go negative, which they often do in, in Iowa with a lot of wind generation they have there, if prices go negative, if they go beneath a certain point, beneath a certain threshold, they can instantly shift worldwide query traffic to, to this server center and max out their, because basically they're getting paid to draw a load. As much, I mean, if they could consume any more, they're still getting paid for this, right? And this, and these prices all change every five minutes, right? So, there's a big opportunity here. So now, now what I've been thinking—this is so mind-blowing. Holy cow! 
Wow. So you can set up, and this not only applies to servers, but this applies to, uh, you know, to especially right now, decentralization push for blockchain for mining. Absolutely. Um, yeah. this, this has so Think many... Think about being able to yeah. relocate, you know, a tractor trailer you know, with, with uh, uh, you know, uh, what are the graphics, the GPUs, right? Yep. Where, you're, where you're just sucking down as much load as possible. Yeah. Um, and you're getting paid because like a place like Iowa has a lot of wind energy at that time. Yeah. And so you're getting paid. Now, why now? Now, here's a quick question. Why wouldn't Iowa keep their generator filled up to 100 percent and not pay you to suck from it? But why wouldn't they just keep it in? And not pay. Well, what, is, doesn't I, that lose I, them money? Again, remember, again, remember uh, they have to keep 60 hertz. So they got wind turbines that are online, and they're and they're pumping out power. Let's say there's a lot of wind. Okay. Now think about this. Okay, because otherwise they'd have to turn it off. Is what you, is so what we're saying. Typically, you would think that they would turn off when the power prices got to zero. Otherwise, they're having to pay. Hey, to, yeah. To, what 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 happens is most of those wind farms are are turning off only when prices get to like negative 37 dollars a megawatt. That negative thirty-seven dollars a megawatt coincides with the uh, subsidy. So you're getting pulled. You're getting paid thirty-seven bucks a megawatt. To they 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 are. They pay, at negative thirty-seven. They pay you to pull. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So at negative thirty-seven dollars, it gets to a point of pain where they, you know, let's say it's negative forty dollars. Now they're losing three dollars a megawatt because they get thirty-seven dollars in subsidies. Oh, the subsidies. Production tax credits. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's, that's, interesting. Yeah. Okay, so at negative 37, they'll keep selling energy because yes. even though you get paid 37 bucks, that acts as a subsidy. Um, okay, and um, that's subsidized by taxpayer dollars. And then, um, as, and then once it gets to negative 40, then they're actually losing $3 per yeah, megawatt. Yeah, negative 40, they'll, so all the, all the generators in the market, all the wind generators in the market, at least in the Midwest ISO, I think most of the other ISOs, do they, they have, stop. Yeah, they, they have. Stop. They have the ability to feather their blades. So at at that at that point, oh. they feather their blades now and they and they stop pretty much. So this would be on a really windy day, and you're seeing wind turbines, and you're like, why are they not Absolutely. working? Yep, that's what happens. If it's you know cool, not much load, um, or there's con or there's there's con uh, congestion. Sometimes there can be a lot of uh, demands in cities, and that creates a lot more pull, you know, across the transmission lines. You got all these wind generators. If you do have wind and it's hot, which is rare, uh, you typically uh, wind is, is uh, inversely proportional to sun, right? Whereas solar is directly proportional to sun. So there's, there's, there's a lot of different features to these uh, green technologies, which are, you know, they go into to, uh, grid planning. Um, hydro, for instance. I've always said that uh, pump storage hydro is, is key, absolutely critical to the proper integration of, of wind generation in this country. And we're lagging behind sorely. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, I think early last year, maybe a year before that, published a report where I think they identified 52 sites in the country, 52 uh, hydro sites where it would be some simple re-engineering and minimal planning to uh, basically create, uh, take a run of river hydro unit, which basically means you got, uh, you know, water coming down a river or you got a, a dam and they release and, it, and they never capture it going back up to be able to pump up to the, to the upper reservoir again, again or above the dam and be able to do that full cycle. Uh, so 52 sites where you could have pump storage. So we're trying to make it cost less energy to move the water up than we get from it running down. So it basically gives you that, that battery component where you're, 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 you're capturing the delta between off-peak prices and, and on-peak prices. And that, see, what happens at night, it, it's really hard for the grid operator sometimes to manage the grid because there's so much wind. And we've got old generators, a lot of these cold, cold generators are, say, uh, running at $17 a megawatt, and they're trying to get these things down as fast as they can. But a lot of these older units are having problems. They, they're just, they don't move very fast anymore. They, they have equipment problems. They got boiler tube leaks when you start cycling them off and on. So they're trying to get everything off they can. So a pump storage unit is a gold mine for an operator because they can suck power at sometimes negative prices. So you're uh -huh. getting paid to consume load again. Yep pump it up to the upper reservoir, and now you're... Getting you know, paid again on yeah. the way down. And then you can store in your battery that energy. Yeah. That is so interesting. 
Wow. Okay. So, whoa, so I'm pulling, damn, I'm pulling from the grid at a, at, they have a negative, there's a negative price, so I'm getting paid to pull, pumping that water up, and then I'm storing the electricity that I generate from the water rolling back that, down. Not only that, but you can actually regulate um, the pumping. So if you, if you have uh, advanced controls in these pumps, now you can, you can float the system, which is important. You got regulation. You need to be able to, to, to uh, control 60 hertz on the system, right? So it can regulate at night, which is, is another tough thing for the, the uh, operator to, to do, is to find some kind of variable resources that can you know, dispatch up and down at a moment's notice. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm, I've kind of probably portrayed the grid as being excessively finicky and, and crazy. You know, negative prices and positive prices. Like it's it's very it's the most uh, it's a market. It's the most dynamic and volatile markets in the world. And so, it is the most dynamic and volatile in the world. Oh, by far, by it's, far, by far. So, so, but but here's what. Here's, and and here's, like you said, weather affects it yeah. tremendously. That's interesting. But here's why. Yeah. So it's not just that the absolute level of prices just goes insanely high, insanely low. It's it's really what's going on is is that the grid operator is 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 operating the grid in the most reliable manner it can. So if you remember the the blackout of 2003, shut down the entire eastern grid. There was. Uh, power lines that were had overhanging branches in uh, Akron, Ohio, and one of them tripped, and that caused a parallel line to get overloaded because power f follows the path of least resistance, Ohm's law and all that stuff, you know. Yeah. And so uh, power fo follows, follows the path of least resistance. So power is going from a generator to load. It's got a bunch of. And if of one paths. cuts off, then, then it follows, the and the, that overloads. And then that overloads, and then that overloads, and it causes a, a cascading. And, out. and when does it? When can we put in these safety well, it, the mechanisms? Well, the grid's supposed to be operated that way, but what what the what the grid operator does in real time, every five minutes, what they're doing is they they, they basically say they go through a contingency analysis, and it's called the n minus one contingency analysis. And so what they say is is that. They're going to go through tens of thousands of lines, and it takes you know pretty fast computers to do this, and be able to sequentially open lines. They they, they open up a line, resolve for the power flow, and say, okay, did it cause a violation on another line? Okay, no, so go to the next one, next one, next one, next one. If they find a line that if they if they open it and it causes a, a violation, which means it's overloading a component, it's a transformer or a line, then they literally in the next um, solution, they assume that line's out. Even though it's not out, they just say, okay, we're going to pretend it's out, and we're going to solve for a power flow solution where in the next five minutes, we need to get resources on, on the far side of this constraint. So they're going to raise generation on the far side. They're going to reduce it on the near side. So they're going to reduce the amount of flow so that in a post-contingent scenario, there's less flow across it, and so it won't exceed the limits on that that that's a monitor device. And so this is happening all over the place. And it's, the grid is incredibly com complex, right? So you we, can we don't even think about this twice when we walk in and flick on the light switch no. or we have the fridge running it's all why, day. It's, it's why, we, run, it's why we, we have the most reliable grid in the world. I, I, I just And we consume 25% of the world's energy and we only have 5% of the world's people. Yeah, I just moved to, to Puerto Rico and um, it rained the other day. And <laughs> the rain comes, we lose power. <laughs> The, the, the sun comes out, we don't lose power, the power comes back. It rains again, we lose power. It's crazy. It's, 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 it, 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 you can't even have refrigeration then. Well, we have uh, backup generators. We have backup but generators. But it's, it's, the generator's coming on, it's, it's transferring, and the power comes back, then it transfers back. It's, 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 it's nuts. So. Could you imagine living like that? No. It's like a third world country. Well, yeah, it is actually in Puerto Rico. They've got so much going for them in other, other ways. But and Think um, about how much that takes away from our cognitive ability to be creative or be innovative. Because one of the main reasons why we can be so creative and innovative today is because we don't have to be so concerned about, oh, when's the energy going to turn off? I'm going to have to dedicate an hour of my time to fixing the energy issue in front of my face. You're telling us about where your business needs to be. And there's all of these different fluctuations that go on the grid with the pricing, the weather, prediction, optimization. So you're figuring out how to write software and machine learning to really figure out the most optimal optimization for this. Yeah, what, what it is, though, is it's... it's, it's 
uh, you know, solving for the power flow on a, in a, on a grid is actually pretty easy because they, they take a very complex AC problem, alternating cur current problem, where you've got capacitances and inductances and circulating currents, and all this stuff. It's very complex, especially on a, on a grid, on a massive grid. But we dumb it all down. The grid, the, uh, the grid operator dumbs it all down, and they assume a DC current uh, problem. So now we're talking basically on water, you know, for you... Uh, engineers out there, or sorry, uh, mechanical engineers, like water flowing through pipes, right? So it's just simple pressure problem. So it's it's very simple problem, but it's incredibly, incredibly complex. The problem is now we're going to, for every input solution we have, let's say we assume a certain amount of load, a certain amount of wind wind generation, certain, you know, certain weather in certain areas, generator availability, transmission line availability. Um, that's one input, base case input. Now you've got tens of thousands of contingencies to run around that. So if I want to run through a lot of probabilistic uh, scenarios here on, on uh, what I think weather might do or what weather wind will show up, you know, two hours early or two hours late or more wind or less wind than forecast or, or the weather is, you know, hotter or colder than forecast. All these things are things that any kind of you know odds maker would do in Vegas, and, and that's kind of what my job is. Is that yeah. I, I'm, I'm trying to run through and, and determine since overall end end result is gonna, I'm looking for sensitivities, and so the grid operators currently don't have the uh, capability to solve for this. They 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 run as a deterministic uh, set point, so they they take all these inputs. Take a load forecast, a wind forecast, generation availability, and take all these inputs and they run it as a, a line in the sand. These are the inputs they're going to solve, and it's a complex solution. And then they and they solve a, they they basically publish a plan for the next 24 hours. These units should be on. These these units should be off. And and so they publish that, and that's it. But what happens is they have a day ahead plan, and then and, and then real time is a, what's called a physical market. Real time happens, and things go all over the place. And it's a, so the grid is a living, breathing monster. If you, if you look at it, yeah. the, the power flow is moving all over the place. The wind generation is moving all over the place. It's, 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 it's constantly moving, constantly in flux. So it's almost, ne it's absolutely, it never actually happens where the real time, you know, real time happens the way day ahead was planned. So what I, what I realize is that, is that with these advanced controls and, and our, moving into the future, if we're going to really, uh, do better at optimizing the way we, we consume load countrywide, nationwide. I feel like one of the best outputs for my business, uh, one of the tertiary outputs, besides just trading power, is to provide uh, an index, if you will, for for uh, control. You know, basically residential or cons uh, industrial demand to be able to forecast their the power prices in the next hour. To 24 hours, maybe 36 hours. Mm -hmm. We can always, they can always, they can respond to prices in real time. It's pretty simple. It's prices are high, you don't consume load. If prices are low, you consume load. That's pretty easy. But we're not talking about like, you know, like a monkey can can do that. But we're talking about like being able to to go f into the future here and, and kind of plan, like you know, pre-cooling your house. You know, if I if I consume load at seven in the morning, when I'm let's say I go to work at seven in the morning now. We're gonna cool the house down to 62 degrees. Yeah. We're gonna freeze you out. But prices are $25 a megawatt. Exactly. Afternoon prices go up to $100 a megawatt. Correct. Now you got a pre-cooled house and you got to consume less, you don't need to consume as much uh, load during those hours yeah. to cool the house down. You still come back to a house that's less than 75 degrees, 77 degrees, let's say. Yeah. Dep depending on your, your, your uh, preferences. But the, uh, the flexibility that any, uh, the flexibility in your consumption of the, of the load uh, aggregated on a, on a portfolio basis on a massive scale can be huge you know it, it cities can do this if, if, if you're exposed to wholesale prices and you can react to this there's a lot of opportunities you know to, to capture the delta between morning prices afternoon prices and so forth yeah. so uh, and, 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 and be of cities like you said too and so be able to, to uh, forecast the congestion. You know, there's, there can be congestion based on certain pockets. You know, there's certain pockets of, of cities, let's say, that with uh, a transmission outage that happened, uh, maybe unforecast or not forecast, um, you want them to consume, to consume as much power as possible. So it's literally that uh, they're having problems um, uh, optimizing the grid without it. So I have 
access to wholesale prices. I have a city of 100,000 houses and I want to optimize the energy consumption for the houses. So I figure out that if someone's leaving, like you said, in the morning, that you can cool the house down right away after they leave, that optimizes um, the cooling in the home. Then also the uh, maybe in the morning or at night you've also taken a lot of energy from the grid and stored it and then during the day you're using it you're selling it so there's all of this uh, that can be optimized through software and through forecasting so you're through, the, through different kinds of generators micro generators let's say and roof i mean you, if, you've, if you've got the ability to store some some power not just electrical power and batteries let's say but but you know mechanical power uh, or hydromechanical power like uh, you know, hot water heaters, uh, pressurized systems, stuff like that. Um, you have the ability to uh, to discharge that whenever you need to, to to be able to generate later on whenever the prices are higher. Okay, so these uh, these advanced communities, late, you know, we're, which we're moving to is will be, you know, they might have micro micro generators on site. You might have um, the ability to store power. Um, I, I just feel like they're going to be. They're going to need to have the information, that, you know, to, to be able to, to make the decisions they need to make. Advanced communities and understanding better energy use in those advanced communities. Um, awesome. So interesting that that's where the business is going. I want to make sure we also talk about subsidies because that was so interesting that what you were describing about mm -hmm. $37 subsidies. Mm -hmm. um, so taxpayer dollars go to energy subsidies for uh, clean energy, wind, yes. water, solar. Uh, not so much water right now. I wish it would, but it's not. And, and so then these um, subsidies go to the, let's take a wind farm as an example. So there's a wind farm and the wind farm, uh, if the grid is a negative 37, let's say it's negative 30. Um, and so then you pull from the grid, you get paid $30, they keep $7. And this, and the only reason this happens is because the government's giving them $37 per megawatt yes. hour. Yes. So what, what it's done, um, I think, is it's, it's really changed the, the grid as far as what's economic and what's not. And you've had historically economic generators um, and some, some generators, like say nuclear units that are closer, uh, well, closer than wind to historical load centers um, that are no longer economic because uh, power prices are so low and, and a lot of it's due to the wind generation. So you got areas which uh, they can't survive on getting revenue from the real-time energy markets. The capacity markets aren't structured very well, so they're not getting any credit for their ability to provide capacity. You know, the wind generator, you know, the American Wind Association says, well, we, we should get credit for capacity, but I can tell you from experience operating a grid, they're not there whenever you got your highest lows of, of the summer. If you've, if you've got hot weather at the, at the highest, you've you got to plan for the, the worst case scenario, right? If you're going to maintain uh, energy security in this country. So you can't plan for, a, a, you know, a, you can't hope, right? You can't, can't hope that everything lines up and, and we have enough wind or enough... Uh, solar at any given time. We have to have, uh, you know, enough of a diversification in our portfolio where we have a reasonable, a very good likelihood that we're going to be able to cover all of our bases. So what ends up happening is in the summertime, you, it's, if it's 100 degrees outside, typically you're not getting a lot of wind generation. You know? It's just, they just don't, they don't work that way. So uh, typically you get a lot of more wind generation at night. Um, there's great times in the, in the shoulder periods of the spring and fall where you got a lot of generators on outage where wind, you know, wind is very helpful. It's it's economic. It's 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 doing its thing, but I, I think it's we, we've got. I think we've kind of overloaded ourselves on one side of things. You know, we got too much wind. I think solar has its purpose, but I, I just, for me personally, uh, this is my opinion. Um, I think it'd be better to see solar on top of of roofs. You know. Shingles. I think what Elon Musk is doing. That idea is, was a fantastic absolutely. idea. It still is. It, it just, and it it's just, just going to it's going to power the home. It's going to power the car. Um, some brilliant stuff. So it, and you can sell it back to the grid. It's yeah. all very interesting. But also, I do have to say that concentration of solar is also very interesting. Absolutely. Um, so like the the um, to 
angle all of the solar up into that main uh, uh, massive pillar structure that then has the molten salt running through it. And, yeah. um, and <laughs> that thing is crazy. It, isn't I've, that really high? Uh, that gives a really high energy output, right? Yeah, I've, I'm a pilot, and uh, I've flown over that thing a few times, and it is bright. I mean, there's a couple around the world that are from satellite views. They yeah. look crazy, but yeah, it can blind. It can fry birds. There's all this kind of crazy stuff. Yeah. But okay, so um, tell us because you were going into the musk and shingles, but I just I just want to know on the subsidy side of things, is this this is good in long term, or or is it more nuanced? Uh, how can it be better? Um, this is my personal opinion again. So I I, I just feel like uh, personally I uh, from my economics classes I I feel like you know. We should assign a socioeconomic cost to pollution, to any kind of uh, factor we want to add. But I would like to see markets price them and let the markets decide what's, what's the most economic at any given time. So uh -huh. if, if wind generation, uh, you give it a credit, like give it a dollar per megawatt credit and we can calculate what those costs are, what those benefits are. If, if uh, pollution on a coal generator for removing uh, SO2 or, or NOx gases is uh, you know, X number of dollars, let's assign them a penalty factor. And then it's easy to now let everything just kind of the chips fall and we can optimize very easily. When we do things where we kind of- So tax pollution's good. Yeah, yeah. It, absolutely. Yeah. So it, it, drives, it drives the proper behavior. So and we need people around the world on the same page about that because if one country is polluting egregiously while the other one is taxing, uh, well, the country that's polluting egregiously can take economic, uh, they can be uh, overly uh, malicious to the Earth's sustainability just so they can economically prosper. Taking advantage. Yeah, this yeah. is more getting, I think, to the point of, uh, this is more local and it's hard to, this is a different problem, I guess, when you're trying to solve for, for macro, you know, the worldwide kind of uh, pollution effects, but and, and you could f yeah, factor that in as well. But, but what happens is when you, when you just give it a brunt force, you know, say X number of dollars per megawatt uh, production tax credit, what it does is it, 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 it drives other generators out of the market because it's what's, yeah, when, when we, uh, I'm drifting away here, you're sir. Drifting. <laughs> so, so when when you when you um, when you what's that's, those are called out of market um, costs or, or or benefits is that and the, and the price can't the, the market can't solve for that and and uh, what happens is you get generators that are otherwise economic that they can't uh, they can't run in those markets and, and they get eventually priced out and they have to shut down and and then lo and behold after ten after the ten year point the uh, production tax credit for a wind farm expires. And now what we see is, is the, these, these wind farms go from negative $37 per megawatt offer to zero, which makes sense because if they generate, they'll make some money. If they don't, mm -hmm. then, or if they, you know, then they don't want to generate when they're losing money, right? Is it safe to say that without a subsidy on wind and solar energy that people would want to pull from fossil fuel sources because it's cheaper? I'm sorry. So, you, if if there wasn't a subsidy for wind and solar energy, that we would pull electricity from fossil fuel faster because or more because it's cheaper. No, actually, what happens is is that the uh, lowest priced uh, uh, fossil fuel generation uh, ends up being coal, uh, typically uh, Powder River Basin coal, which would be like uh, say seventeen dollars a megawatt, uh, all in to the market and Beneath that, you've got fixed generation, which can't respond to dispatch, so it doesn't matter. Nuclear generation, it's going to run if it runs because... So it, it, with coal, it would cost me $17 a megawatt hour to buy it? Yes. And then for, for wind, how much does it cost? Well, wind is, you know, free, right? If, if, yeah, if, you, right. Si if, you, if you assume that. So, I mean, there, you have operation and maintenance costs, which, you know, yeah. you might want to... And maybe, up front Maybe costs. it's a dollar a megawatt. I'm yeah. not sure, but... But the fact is, is that between seventeen dollars megawatt and zero, there's nothing in there that's going to move besides wind. So it really doesn't matter um, whether they have a, a, a subsidy or not. If they didn't have a subsidy, they'd still be the most efficient resource on the grid. 
Damn, it's almost like it's just it's just blowing my mind because I'm literally envisioning setting up one wind turbine and then just having the free wind to come and power yeah. versus like taking and lugging coal and burning it and lugging coal and burning well, it. It just doesn't make any sense in no, comparison. See, it, it, that, there's so many nuances to this. That yeah. People see what I've learned. I, I got an amazing experience working on the desk at XL Energy. Um, I was a day ahead analyst running the Colorado subs, uh, uh, system, uh, public service company of Colorado, and uh, optimizing, running the, the models, looking at, for, at our opportunity costs, whether we should be buying or selling off the grid, setting our, our pricing uh, for those, and determining which units should run, which, wouldn't, which ones shouldn't. And, you know, uh, it was a great job. And then doing the same thing up in uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Northern States Power. What, what, what I learned is, is that... Um, there are times, you know, there are times. There's ever, always room for nuance, so here we the go. Black, the black swan? Yes. So, yeah, yeah, so let's do you, it. you know, let's, let's, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta plan for fact, things that you could never imagine, okay? Totally. Um, 2013, I think, we had a huge freeze in Texas, okay? And all these generators just got w wiped out, and they a had. Freeze meaning? They had a hard freeze, got. Um, it was, uh, I don't know, I think it was a rainstorm event or something like that where basically you had, you had a precipitation event and extremely cold temps, which caused a lot of units to shut down. They, they weren't ready for it. They didn't, have, they didn't take precautions uh, for all kinds of various things to do on a coal plant. But basically, they lost a lot of baseload generation, and they had uh, rotating blackouts. So um, let's, think, let's think about this. So in the wintertime... Uh, in cold places, let's say northern, you know, say Minnesota or New England or anywhere in Colorado, let's say, um, you've got gas plants that are only getting their gas after consumers, the residential uh, customers, get their gas. And so typically gas generation is further down the pipeline than residential gas. And so there's times when, when it gets really, really cold, let's say negative 10 degrees in Colorado, negative 25 degrees in Minneapolis, St. Paul when you, they, they curtail you. So power plant says, the power plant doesn't get any more gas. So now they have to shut down, now what's gonna run? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'll tell you that, you know, you're not getting any, you might get wind generation at those. At, Usually at those fossil points. fuel. So what, the, the ability to store That's a where month. where all the nuance comes in. Another month, you know, let's say a coal plant has probably a month, month and a half of coal sitting on a pile. Yeah. And, th and that energy security is invaluable. It's interesting. It, it, it's absolutely just critical. in case. Yeah. Otherwise, it can be really bad if the grid has to turn off the and hold. You can't pull energy because there is no wind. There is no solar. Yeah. There's, oh, interesting. So, there, I mean, there's there's, you know, coal, obviously <laughs> it, coal. There, there's varying levels of coal, I, obviously. You know, I worked for Calpine, and we, we operated the cleanest fleet of natural gas fired generators in the country. And so you and I could talk about this for so I long. <laughs> I know, and and I and I want to make sure that we touch a bit on uh, your biohacking interests as well, because this is super fascinating. Um, and on the way out, because this is already um, a really interesting, complicated, um, nuanced interview on energy markets, and it's been super enriching, and we've dived into a lot of good alleys. Let's talk a bit about um, your biohacking on the way out, um, so we can also not go super long on the interview, and I'll also chop this up into bits as well and circulate those. So um, on the biohacking side of things, um, teach us about this, uh, the hyper oxygen, hyperbaric oxygen, hyperbaric yeah. oxygen chamber. Hyperbaric oxygen. So we have like 21% of the atoms okay. here are oxygen and we're inhaling that mm -hmm. um, to circulate blood in our body to power our body. Yeah. Um, and so what does a hy hyperbaric, is this a concentration of it? And then how do I feel? Do I feel like, ah, oh. so this is really about not just oxygen, it's about oxygen under pressure. So oxygen under pressure is a drug. And it's a drug that turns on and off 6,000 up to 6,000 genes in your body. Whoa! It's 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 incredible. So, there's a book by uh, written by Dr. Uh, Harch, who is the uh, world's leading expert down in Louisiana. It's called the uh, the Oxygen Revolution. I, I uh, read it. It's incredible. I think it's a must read for anybody that has any kind of ailment. Um, but uh, what, what ended up happening was I uh, for any ailment it could ju rejuvenate let me, the body. Let me let me let me let me, uh, <laughs> let me qualify that. So. 
So let me back that down a little. So it can do incredible things. I don't want to oversell it. Um, there's so many more things it can do that we realize, um, and we're going to get to that point. So what Dr. Harch has done, he, he kind of pioneered, pioneered this stuff in the 90s and, and uh, uh, was kind of labeled, uh, I'm not sure, but kind of like maybe what uh, chiropractors were labeled by the Medical Association back in the day. We're just starting to now kind of come to a, a real sense of acceptance on what the, the benefits of that are. Or maybe now it's acupuncture. What is that? Is it, yeah. is it a fringe thing? Does it have any benefit or is it just entertainment value? So, um, so when it comes to hyperbaric oxygen, so Dr. Harch uh, fought and fought and fought. He, he basically realized he was working with people, uh, uh, he was working with divers, Navy divers, and typically hyperbaric oxygen was something that was only used for, uh, you know, to, to cure divers that had the bends and, and so forth. So, but he, he started realizing he could do so much more, and so he did a lot of testing. He accumulated a lot of evidence and a lot of uh, uh, data, um, spec scan uh, data from the brain, like showing you the uh, blood flow in the brain, and so, showing quality, you know, quantitatively what's going on in the brain whenever you do uh, this therapy. Um, what, he, what he ended up getting, the, uh, he got a lot of pushback from the medical associations and the uh, insurance companies and so forth. Uh, trying to, so I guess a lot of people were saying, you know, hyperic oxygen could do all kinds of things. And it was, you know, he's trying to keep it very narrow and focused because he doesn't want to be labeled. So is this um, pressurizing O2? Yeah, so it, it's basically, there's different levels of it. So you got, you know, NFL, a lot of these NFL players or athletes will have, uh, and I have myself actually, a, 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 a semi-rigid uh, uh, pressure vessel in your house. It mines uh, like a can like a canvas type uh, container, and um, it's pretty comfortable to get in. But it's you're, you basically have 93 percent oxygen coming off of a uh, oxygen uh, like you see at the at the at the nursing home, right? It's, and you it's a, a tank. It, it's not a tank. I actually have one. It's it's one of those. Uh, man, I'm losing my mind here. So it's like one of those. Uh, it's called a. Uh, it's like a little machine there. Like you, you might see it uh, at a doctor's office. Oh, sure, sure. But and then you can control the oxygen uh, output from it yeah, into your environment. Yeah, typically it's about 92, 93 percent, and it's you'll see them at nursing homes and so forth. Okay. Um, and then you're sitting in a closed room, so you can increase the oxygenation of the room. No, this is actually in a tube, so it's it's. Then you're breathing from the tube. Then I get in. I get in this big tube, and it's and it's got a little bed in there and, yeah. and pillow, and, and yeah. it's got windows and stuff, and. I, uh, and so you zip it up, it's got some pleats and stuff, it, it, and then it is a double stage compressor and it pressures up, pressurizes up to like 1.3 atmospheres, which is about the equivalent of being 12 feet underwater. Pressure Whoa. Wise. And a lot of, the, a lot of these Whoa. athletes. What, is, what happens to the body when you're like laying at 1.3? So what happens is that you uh, press, you'll feel your ears, you know, you'll equalize and you get to this certain pressure where you, you uh, stay steady state. Does it feel good on your bones and your muscles? I wouldn't say bones so forth, but um, I just I lay in there and I, I work, I relax. So yeah. it's it's not an explosive environment. Uh, the, it's a lower oxygen state. So now medical grade oxygen would be 100 percent oxygen in a, in a uh, hospital, uh -huh. and like say up to three atmospheres of pressure. Wow. That's that's an environment where you can't even have a wool shirt on. You know, you don't want to have any kind of sparking uh, going on in there. So okay, um, but okay. And so what what's gonna, the benefit of when you're inhaling so, the so what happens is your, your, your red blood cells are able to absorb your cap, I think is your red blood cells are able to absorb up to 10% more oxygen than we're breathing right now, say at near sea level and 21% uh, oxygen. But what happens is, is your, your plasma is able to absorb 700 to 1000%, uh, I think in excess of 700% more uh, oxygen. Your plasma is smaller than your red blood cells. Your plasma typically is transported further in, now we're getting into doctor realm, sir. I'm, I don't, I'm sure if there's any doctors listening. So, I don't but but you can, your red blood cells uh, are able to carry 10% more 10 oxygen. More, which isn't that much more, but your plasma. That's a lot. Well, your plasma can carry 700% more, like a lot more. Oh, so, wow, that's huge. Yeah, so what ends up happening is, is it, it's carrying oxygen to every f f crevice of your body, every, f the, every the furthest expanses of your body. And you feel really good. Very, well, yeah, you, you, you do feel really good. I, I, I practice deep breathing in there. If for nothing else, if you didn't believe in anything this thing does, it's, you get in there and I do some deep breathing and it's great and it's relaxing. So I get in there and I work. Yeah. But what, what happens is, is that you're, you're, uh, you're getting blood flow to places in your body that doesn't see it very often. You know? 
or you might, as we get older, <clears throat> older you might have some injuries or some uh, what Dr. Hartz labels as a as a as a as a, a slight to the body or an insult to the body, where you've got totally, you know, totally. You've got parts of your brain that might be a little bit restricted in blood, and a lot of a lot of neurological. Or people conditions. hurt their near their back, stuff like that as well. Yeah, a lot of neurological conditions are, I guess, uh, basically they're. they're they come down to a restriction in blood flow. Restriction in of blood flow, interesting. So what I, what I read in, in Dr. Harcher's book, which, which kind of fit me, was that he, he thinks that every ambulance someday will have hyperbaric oxygen chamber in the ambulance because, as an example, a stroke uh, patient can completely recover from all effects of a stroke if they get into a chamber within the, within the hour. Damn. Can. I'm not saying they will. That's but. interesting. So, and there's a bunch of other things when it comes to, uh, you know, traumatic brain injuries um, that, uh, that... Hyperbaric oxygen can help with neurological issues, traumatic brain injury, stroke issue. This is PTSD. so interesting. PTSD. PTSD is actually symptomized. I guess one of the symptoms of PTSD is that it's, it causes a, uh, uh, a swelling of the brain. Um, inflammation. I'm, I'm sorry, no, not a swelling. A, a shrinking of the brain. A shrinking. Yeah, that's what it is. It's, it's, it's. I was now again. This I'm reading all this. So I'm not a doctor. So I was to, Psychedelics helps with PTSD as well. Yeah. So I, I just, I was, so I was fascinated with this book, and and uh, uh, I actually bought my oxygen chamber as a, as a, uh, I was giving it. I was going to give it to a soldier that had um, suffered a traumatic brain brain injury, and. Um, his parents weren't quite comfortable that he was going to be able to get out of the chamber quick enough, so they actually went to Dr. Hartz directly. And he is, you want to talk about a miracle. This kid is close to doing his 80th dive, I think, in the past six months. And he has gone from nearly a, basically a vegetable to now sitting up, feeding himself, singing, talking. It's, it's incredible. 80th dive into hyperbaric oxygen? So what call a dive is, is basically like maybe an hour, hour and a half. I think it's about an hour. And of, he used to be paralyzed? Basically, no, not paralyzed, but basically a vegetable. A he, vegetable as in couldn't move, yeah, couldn't he had leave his, his entire brain, or half of his brain caved in. So. Oh my gosh, and then was able to move, dance, sing, etc. Yeah, it's... And it's, this could also be very helpful for veterans, like you said. So, which is crucial when they come back that they are able to reintegrate into communities and societies maximally. Wow. Yeah. So the the uh, the thing is is that the uh, let's let's wrap up now. So go ahead. Go ahead. So this is probably uh, the, the the Veterans Administration, the VA, finally started looking at this, getting a lot of pressure from the, their constituents and the the senators and all that stuff. Um, basically, the uh, VA did a study which was a faulty, uh, where they, they they insisted on having a control group. So you have people, you know, getting oxygen under pressure, but they said, well, the control group, you have to have a chamber under pressure because if they weren't pressurized and didn't feel it with their ears, then they, they would know that they were, they yeah. were, yeah. yeah so yeah. The, the thing is, though, when you get a, a chamber under pressure, you go from 21% oxygen, and if it's, a, let's say it's, you're bringing them up to, to 1.5 atmospheres, now you're up to 30%. Oxygen, yeah, and so they were getting. They're both groups are getting benefits, yeah, and they basically said, "Well, we, we statistically can't uh, prove um, that it's enough of, a, of an improvement on the oxygen under pressure." It's interesting when you the, can't manage a control like that. That's yeah. funny. So interesting. It just it's going to be someday the uh, they're going to get this this uh, therapy. I, I know it's going to happen. And Dr. Harsh has gotten uh, so many different uh, treatments approved for. Uh, reimbursements from the insurance companies like, um, you know, diabetic foot wounds, right? I think he's saved like 70,000 limbs a year Whoa. now because that, those are all being reimbursed. Diabetic foot wounds. Absolutely. Yeah, because it cut off circulation of that part of the body and then you can reinvigorate circulation with hyperbaric oxygen. Wow. Okay, so you're ahead of your time with hyperbaric oxygen. Um, I think, you know, Va our friends at Vaspar are ahead of their time. There's so many of these biohacker hackers and biohacking in general that, you know, Tony's a big fan of, as well as you are and so many other people that we've had on the show. Um, energy markets, what an incredible dive into energy markets as well. Um, I feel so much more understanding of the nuance of it and i only know 0.001 more <laughs> but it, it's it's so important to understand where our energy actually comes from and also um, how to maximize uh, energy across the world because energy does increase the standard of living it maximizes people's potential into the world um, jim what an absolute pleasure thank you
Well, thanks for coming on to the show. Um, we'll have Jim's links in the bio. Definitely go check it out. If you guys had a good time with what you learned, definitely go share some of the knowledge you've learned with two other people about energy markets or biohacking. Go and take that and go share it. Don't just consume this content. Go create with it. Make videos. Make blog posts. Go write about it. Go make videos about it. Start companies in it, etc. Also, join us on Patreon. We need to continue sustaining this project and growing it and impacting more people, doing more live events, getting to the sports stadium. So join us there. Link's in the bio as well. Thanks, everybody, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.